from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hey, everybody. <laughs> you got to look at yourselves. You are one beautiful crowd. Woo! Welcome to the fourth annual National Book Festival Teen Poetry Slam. My name is Sarah Browning. I have the great, incredible privilege of being the co-founder and executive director of Split This Rock. We are, we are so proud to co-sponsor this slam with the Library of Congress and the National Endowment for the Arts and to be here on this beautiful, cold, rainy September 2nd with all of you and with remarkable teen poets from the Washington, D.C. area, from Baton Rouge, from Minneapolis, and from Portland, Oregon. Let's give it up, right on. Woo. I want to give a shout out to our ASL interpreters. Yeah. I think they've been working hard all day, am I right? Yes. And you know what? Poetry is not easy to interpret. No, it's not. No. And especially these teen poets, because they have to keep in a time limit. And so sometimes they talk very fast. Yeah. So we're going to be shouting them out all evening. So a huge thank you for their hard work and dedication. That's right. And a thank you to the National Book Festival for always having interpretation and other access for people with disabilities. Right on. So I'm going to take a second to tell you about Split This Rock. We are a national organization based here in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to cultivate, teach, and celebrate poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes social change. You think we need some of that poetry right now? I think we do. You think we've been needing that poetry for the last 400 years? Yeah, I think we have. We've been having that poetry, too, in the United States and throughout the world, throughout all of human history. And it's Split This Rock's mission to elevate those voices, young, older, <laughs> our forebears and our current brilliant practitioners at all levels of their careers, of their writing lives. And we are uh, just incredibly moved by the poetry that is being written, performed, published in America and throughout the world today. Split This Rock is proud to present that poetry and to foster it in many programs nationally and throughout the Washington, D.C. area. Our cornerstone programs are a biannual, that means every two years, biennial. We always get that wrong. Poetry Festival, Split This Rock Poetry Festival, Poems of Provocation and Witness. You're all invited. The next one is April 19th to the 21st, 2018. You have time to plan for those dates. You better be there. I invite you to visit the table at the back where Sue and Reuben are sitting there to welcome you. They're waving at you. They're beautiful. There they are. And um, you can sign up for the listserv there, or you can visit us on Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebook. <laughs> and sign up to get not only updates about programs, including Split This Rock Poetry Festival coming up April 19th to the 21st, 2018, but also every week, Split This Rock Poem of the Week. Because we're creative like that, we're poets. It's called Split This Rock Poem of the Week. And it'll come to you in your inbox or on social media, a poem by a contemporary poet reflecting on the pressing social issues of today in all kinds of different ways. And it comes to you on Friday morning. You might be a government functionary. Any of those in this room? Yeah. Yeah, you might be a teacher. You might be a religious leader. You might just be somebody whose heart is hurting. We got any of those folks in the room today? Yeah. And maybe 
you need a little bit of poetry in your life. So sign up for that poem of the week. Uh, you won't be sorry. Our other signature program is a youth program, and you're going to see that highlighted today. We've got after-school poetry clubs in high schools throughout the D.C. area. We're the home of the D.C. Youth Slam Team. Three stars. Hey. That's a thing. They do it. Yeah. Um, and open mics at Bus Boys and Poets, two locations, 5th and K in Sherlington, Virginia. And check us all out at, at splitthisrock.org for more. All right, then. Woo! And I just want to ask you all, I want to ask you all to, um, to support young voices. This is the future. This is the future not just of poetry, not just of this country, but of our earth, the voices you're about to hear. And we need to invest and support these young people and the great variety, the great richness of youth voices that you're about to hear tonight. So thank you for being here. And with that said, it's my very great pleasure to introduce your MC tonight, our Split This Rocks Youth Programs Coordinator. You've already seen him once. I give you my colleague, my friend, Joseph Green. Which one? I think that each one of these mics calls for a different type of speaking. Um, this is my spoken word. Uh, hey everybody, how you doing tonight? Make some noise! This is my Barack. <laughs> it's going to be a good evening. <laughs> poetry, poetry, poetry. All right. <laughs> Just an idea I had. Hi, my name is Joseph Green and I'm going to be your host. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a spoken word event, slam or open mic. True, true, true. All right, hands down. Raise your hand if you've never been to one of these events before. Woo! <laughs> Welcome. This is going to be a good time for all, but there is a caveat to that. This is only going to be a good time if you open yourself up to that good time, right? We can be standing in front of something prolific, but if our minds are closed, there's no way for that message to get in. And there's so many things that get in the way of that happening, right? We see someone who doesn't look like us. We see someone and they say something that we disagree with or they come from a place we don't come from and all of a sudden we shut off. On this stage today, there are going to be young people from all over this country, all shapes and sizes and colors and sexual identities and, and, and all of that is going to be here on display for you laid at the altar of your consideration and it will make you a better person if you open yourself up to it. So if you're ready to have a good time, I'm going to need y'all to make some real noise right now. It feels good. It feels good. So for those of you who've never been to a poetry slam before, I'm going to take you through a couple of rules so you understand what's about to happen here. Tonight, we have seven competitors from all over the country who have prepared poems, original pieces that they will share with you. Those poems have to be within three minutes with a 30 second grace period. There's a first round and a second round. And the first round, because we are sponsoring this slam with the Library of Congress in honor of the book festival, they have to read a poem that is about reading or writing or education or something under that umbrella. So they had to write new poems just for this event, right? The second round can be about anything they want. So brace yourselves. Okay, so a poetry slam is a competition where you're gonna hear a poem. And we have some very special people in the audience today who are in charge of judging the poetry. Now we realize how silly that is, the idea that we're gonna take something that is subjective and objectify it. But this is America. <laughs> and so we have found a way. So they will, hear the, they will hear the poems. A zero will be the worst poem they have ever heard. Simultaneously, all of us will fall asleep and the slam will be over. Right? Now, 
a 10 is the best poem they have ever heard. Simultaneously, all of us will be awoken and float up to whatever is next for us. That's it. No more slam, nothing, we're good, all right? So when that happens, you'll feel it, you'll know. All right, and so these judges have a very, very hard job, right? They have to take this art and give numbers to it. Audience, you also have a job. This is a participatory sport, okay? So the judges will give their scores, then I will call them out. I will say 7.5. Your job at that point is to react in whatever way you think is appropriate. If you feel that score is accurate to the poet, you will cheer and say, yay! I believe that is a very accurate score. You have to say that every time, no. Um, if you do not agree with the score, we don't boo here. We say, listen to the poem, because maybe they missed it, right? They, they give it a 6.5 and you were about to transcend to another place, right? Maybe it didn't come in. So you say, listen to the poem. So I'm going to need everyone to work with me. Uh, I'm going to call out a score that you disagree with, and I need you to be loud and exuberant and tell me what you're going to do. All right, here we go. 4.5. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's going to be fun. Now I want to introduce you to our esteemed judges. I'm going to go over to my Barack mic. <clears throat> so we have somebody else special in the audience that I'm going to announce before. All right, so this is the Library of Congress National Book Festival. And the Library of Congress has a librarian of Congress. And she is in the building tonight. Please clap it up, Ms. Carla Hayden! You want to say something? Come on, say something. And this always gets me all juiced up because last year I got to be a judge and it's hard work. <laughs> this is a rough crowd. Cause I got, didn't I get yeah. challenged? I thought, I thought you did a good job though. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're contractually responsible to say so. Okay. No, no. <laughs> but I just want to tell you, enjoy the, we've, I've talked about this slam for the rest of the year and it gave me inspiration and awesome. I just had to come and say thank you all for being here. Thank you for everybody that's going to get up here and share with us. I appreciate that. They appreciate that. Young people, thank you. your Woo! library of Congress. Thank you. Proud to live in a world where things like this are still important. All right. So now to your esteemed judges. <clears throat> One of your first judges, you may or may not have heard of him, um, his, no, his, nom, his name is Juan Felipe Herrera. And so each judge was asked to give uh, a little bit to say about themselves, and this is what he said about himself. Um, recent poet laureate, and for the young people performing tonight, I believe in you. Can we clap it up for Juan Felipe Herrera? Our next judge goes by the name of Elizabeth Acevedo. Now, here what's funny about that. Not everybody in the room clapped because everyone don't know Elizabeth yet. But I'm going to tell you some things about Elizabeth because next year everybody in this room is going to be clapping. It goes like this. She's a National Poetry Slam champion. Her debut YA novel, The Poet X, out from HarperCollins, will be out for sale March 2018. Additionally, that festival that Sarah was talking about that happens every two years next April, she will be a featured reader at that festival. Can we please clap it up for Elizabeth Acevedo? And next, we have Melissa De La Cruz. Author of The Disney Descendants and Alex and Eliza, a novel about young Alexander Hamilton and Elizabeth Schuyler, which, which, 
let me tell you, I cannot wait to buy that book. Um, and, Im important enough to know, how do I, do I look as good in the light as I did in the, I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we're just gonna keep it going. Uh, also, she once came in third in a slam of three people. Can we please clap it up for Melissa De La Cruz? Our next judge, Adrian Matika. Clap. There you go. There's a new book out, Map to the Stars. One of the finals judges for the Poetry Out Loud competition this year, and one of the most pleasant individuals I've met here at the book festival. Please clap it up for Adrian Matika. And last but not least, his name is Joey Riceberg. Clap for him now. He is a rising senior at Carver Center in Townsend. He is the 2016 National Poet for the Northeast. And his favorite thing is to see young people with talent rise. Clap it up. Now back over here. I'm going to read out the names of the poets who are performing tonight. Um, they, 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 what are they, if you come from a city, what's that called? They hail, thank you. This is participatory. If I ask a question, just shout it out. All right. They hail from these cities. Anybody in here from Portland, Oregon? That, that didn't come with one of the teams? How about anybody here from the North? west of the country. Make some noise. Don't raise your hand. Make some noise. <laughs> High five. Um, all right. So we also have a team here from Baton Rouge. Anybody here from that part of the country? Make some noise. These two people are super excited to be from that part of the country. Welcome. All right. We also have poets from Minneapolis. Yes. Anybody here from that part of the country? Awesome, all right. We also have poets from DC. Anybody here from DC? All right, I'm saying that to say this. For the rest of the evening, we are on team clap for everybody, right? That's the team that we are representing. So when you see somebody come to the stage, you clap like the future is coming to the stage and your clapping is reflective of how bright you want the future to be. All right, so I'm gonna call out their names and that's the type of energy I'm gonna need to hear right now. We have Maya, Catherine, Taya, Anaya, Asher, Sophia, and Chazzy! This is a yes or no question. Are you ready for a poetry slam? You only had two choices and you got it wrong. So if you've never been to a poetry slam before, there's something that we do at the beginning. Uh, it's called uh, the sacrificial poet. Um, not as gory as it sounds. Um, this poet's job is to calibrate the judges to make sure that they are ready for the performance. This person is not in the actual slam, so they're not up to win, but the score that the judges give will be what they use as their litmus for the rest of the program. So. Uh, we typically have a poet, just like the rest of the poets, who come up and read an original poem. Unfortunately, one of the poets from Baton Rouge was unable to join us. She has a heart condition and is in uh, on bed rest right now and couldn't make it. Her name is Jasmine Smith. Can we give her a round of applause because this is being filmed and her poetic spirit is about to be felt in this room. So, reading one of Jasmine's poem, the one that she created for this space, Form, or excuse me, current member of the DCU Slam team. Three stars. Hey, please put your hands together for Tyka Wallace. In elementary school, we were, always, we were always given secondhand books. 
I knew this because once I learned to read, the stamps on the inside cover read, property of, insert wealthy school name here. The pages were torn and written on, and I always wondered what it would be like not to receive a secondhand education. If children are the future, the kids in my elementary school were learning to take what they got, to not protest too much, to accept outdated information. I guess a bunch of black kids from Glen Oaks weren't worthy of fresh prints. When I got to high school, the admission requirements got harder, which is to say the students got wider and the textbooks got newer, hot off the presses with glossy covers. When your school is black, volunteer organizations will paint murals to brighten up the black neighborhoods. When your school is historically white, you will have thousand dollar gymnastics mats. Somewhere across town, a white child is playing on a brand new jungle gym while a black student flips through a book with missing pages. White students receive iPads because textbooks take too much maintenance. Black kids tape pages together trying to piece their history back together. White kids get salad bars and we get another vending machine filled with junk food. They'd rather watch black schools dissolve into ash, rather watch them wash away than give them resources. Rather spend a million dollars renovating the white school than making sure there are enough teachers at the black one. When did, separate, when did separate but equal become part of the curriculum? If we had accurate history books, we could see that it was never taken out. We could see how ink smudges look a lot like the blood of my ancestors and how their pain is consolidated into a civil rights chapter like they haven't been surviving this entire time. Like these books... My city is so segregated you could divide it in half, which is as much math as they teach us around here anyway. They call my high school a castle, the way it towered over the city, and maybe that's why it felt more like a guarded tower for privilege than a place of enrichment. The school was built by people who couldn't have walked its hallways, and its whiteness is deafening, its resources is, are deafening, its classism is deafening. If reading and writing are so essential, then how come they have written us out of this narrative? How come the right to a decent education is property of, insert wealthy school name here? When they rip a solid education from black hands like ripping pages out of a children's book, it becomes clear that we were not meant to learn. Yo, she was given that assignment like 30 minutes ago, right? <laughs> Judges, that is the longest amount of time you will be given to come up with your scores. In fact, I am talking even longer now to make sure that in 10 seconds when I say, judges, show me your scores, you are prepared. Five, four, three, two, one. Judges, show me your scores. I tried. From low to high, we have a seven, a seven, a 7.3, a 7.4, and a 7.6. Clap it up for the poet, please. I am so happy that was the first poem read. Um, for anybody in here who was questioning, I wonder where this is going to go. That's where it's going to go. Um, and, I, and I say this not as a warning, because I don't care to warn you, um, but in the hopes that this work is received well. Um, if you have a feeling when you hear some of these poems, like, that's not right, or that makes me feel weird, or like an allergy, right? Stop. Be mindful. Ask yourself, why is that the feeling I'm feeling? Could there be something wrong in this world that doesn't directly affect me? Possibly. <laughs> and how can we make the world a better place by caring for one another, right? Don't discount it because it don't make sense to you or it doesn't happen in your neighborhood. That's why we're here in this space, because we want to bring these stories to an entirely new audience. We have poetry slams all over the city. We want you all to understand that there are young people on this planet that exist outside of the realm of what you see in the news, right? Or what you think about when you go and you see like whatever the new pop movie is. There are people, young people who are considerate, who are aware, who are awoke, still waking, trying to wake the world, right? And a lot of them are here tonight. So please keep that in mind, that this is not easy for them. As confident as they will seem, this is not easy for them. As you would imagine any of you in front of a thousand people you've never met before. 
talking about something particularly personal. All right, so that's the level we're gonna set, all right? That's the type of courage and bravery, and that's what we need rewarded when we bring the young people on stage. Now, I have a simple yes or no question. Hint, the answer is yes. Are you ready for a poetry slam? Please put your hands together for the first poet in the first round, Maya! Some kids come to school, wounds deep as wells, hidden beneath band-aid stretched skin. Teachers demand they try harder to pull themselves apart, to see how much more blood they have left to give, to sign an oath on the top of their assignment. Chubby cheeks and bright eyes line the altar, their thoughts more profound than those of philosophers they will someday be assigned to read. Their minds bustle with curiosity. So why does schoolwork look like human sacrifice? Children sacrifice their creativity for the system's convenience. The system sacrifices children for money, throws five-year-olds onto assembly lines that move too quickly, not allowing them to catch their breath, painting them with wide brush even though there's only enough pigment for a few bristles, letting the ones who never had a chance fall through the cracks and into the locked doors of the principal's office. Reduce their cries for help by calling it misbehavior. Punish them with out-of-school suspensions. Convince them they're just like criminals on house arrest. Throw them into the cells of private prisons. This will be easy when white people in dark suits paint darker children to look like dollar signs in jumpsuits. Skimp on their education knowing it will lead to crime. Do not teach them to read. Stuff this poetry of 17th century white men down their throats, especially when they are choking. Force them to analyze someone else's words so formulaically they forget how to use their own. Assign books so unrelatable they never want to read for pleasure again. Do not teach them to write with their own voice. Tell them it is too informal. Let them know that stories of truth and trauma must be packaged pretty enough for the palatability of their oppressors. Value the stories of slave-owning presidents and do not tell them their country was built on graveyards of stolen land and stolen breath. Watch them fill in circles as their minds grow numb from stress and stimulants. Blood pumping with Adderall to replace the curiosity that got bled out of them. It is easy to do this when they see learning as the enemy. If somehow a child begins to emerge from these ashes still curious, still fighter, still authentic, tell their parents they have a learning disorder. Make them feel incompetent for failing to turn into Plato in the hands of a system that wants them molded into perfect soldiers. Tell them that they will drown in this quicksand and immediately throw them a prescription pill. Convince them it is a life preserver. Convince them this thing they do for 40 hours a week is a life preserver, even when they tell you they don't know how to preserve their own happiness for the life of them. Do not teach them their rights. After all, it is your job to sculpt kids to be prisoners. In jobs, they will learn to hate. In cycles of poverty, they will never have the tools to break. In jail cells where you throw away their ballot and chain them to a world that will never change. Call it democracy. But when you see another generation in shackles, don't you dare call it freedom. Judges, scores in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have a 6.9, a 7.1, a 7.2, a 7.3, and a 7.9. Clap it up for the poet, please. So, testing, check. One, two, how's my mic sound? My mic sounds nice, check, one. Okay, y'all aren't ready. All right, so uh, if you heard during that first poem, there were people who were snapping, right? 
right? If you hear a line that you like, it's okay for you to snap, right? That way you can be like, yo, I really like that poem, but I'm not going to interrupt it by walking up to the stage and saying, hey, I enjoyed that line, <laughs> right? So let's practice that real quick. Everybody snap. Yes. I love doing that in large crowds because I grew up eating Rice Krispies and I close my eyes and I remember. Um, you can also say word. Everybody say word. word. You can make that sound you make when you have a delicious piece of chocolate. Didn't even have to tell you. And last but not least, you can do something that I really like, uh, invented by a friend of mine, Amin Drew Law. Uh, you can take the word she, and you can take the word Jesus, and no matter your religious affiliation, you can smush them together. And if you hear something that makes you feel particularly holy, you say, Jesus. <laughs> it feels better when you participate, so I'm gonna need everybody in this room to give me their best Jesus on the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus. Doesn't it feel good to participate? <laughs> if you're ready for your next pose, say yeah. Yeah. Coming up next to the stage, please put your hands together for Catherine! According to my journal, I'm having more good days than bad. A tiny heart on the cover corner, a page for each day, written in at night with the easiest key in the world. Yellow is for happiness. Pink, good, purple, survivable, green, sad. Blue days, blue days are bad. A childish word for how I feel when I don't get out of bed, but I want to. To clean up my room and uncover the scraps of yellow paper on my floor, fold pink blankets, wear my favorite purple socks. Bad as if bad even comes close to how I feel right then. Bad as if I feel anything bad, like it only took 10 minutes for a doctor to prescribe me something and bad like it's not working. According to my journal, yellow doesn't show up that much, but there's lots of pink. The color of smoothies I've started drinking and my new sheets of my best friend's nails and sister's cheeks. According to my journal, I'm getting better. According to my therapist, I'm a lovely child. You're welcome, Mom. According to her, I'm eating again. According to me, yellow is for days when I lean against my best friend in history, when the sunset was at 6.51 instead of 4, when my brother knocks on my door just to say he loves me. Yellow is for days when I'm convinced I've been faking it all these years. Yellow, like my skin after another day of not eating, like the honeysuckle candle I bought to remind me of summer wind, yellow like the painting in my kitchen, the one my grandma owned. February 13th, 2012, I wore a yellow shirt to school, daring, brave, bravely drawing eyes on me. My siblings and I ran off the school bus. My mom sat us down on the couch, and I've seen my mom cry before, but not like this, finding me hidden by my bookshelf in tears as she decides it's okay to tell a 12-year-old her grandmother committed suicide, the grandmother who taught her how to cook bright yellow eggs, salt golden buttery popcorn just right, and teach patients enough to watch any sunset. She didn't have time to teach me how to draw, so every letter I write is straight lines. A book of pink, yellow, blue, green, purple, it's missing violet. Indigo, chartreuse, aubergine, bumblebee, bright, sunshine, gold, butterscotch, canary, daffodil, mustard, lemon, raincoat, blonde. The hair color we share. Shared. According to my journal, I'm getting better. February is over, the sun's staying out later, I'm cutting my hair soon. I'll buy another pen in case my yellow ever runs out and cover pages with reminders of my happiest days. I will publish books that open and spill yellow ink onto your laps, magazines with foldouts for every shade imaginable, and essays written in pink, articles in purple, poems printed in green, obituaries written in my blue pen. Judges, scores three, two, one, from low to high, 7.3, 7.7, .7. 
8.2, 8.4, and an 8.5. Clap it up for the poet. Keep that energy going for the next poet in the first round, Taya! All the way to the stage, folks. All the way to the stage. So you're about to embark on your first year at Hogwarts. I know it's scary, starting a new school can be scary, but fear not, my sweet first year, as I impart onto you the knowledge I've gained from years of house cups and potions classes that I wish I had had when I was a young witch. No standardized test can measure your magic. The brightest wizard can fail and the dullest can thrive. No multiple choice mess can measure just how magical you are. Your newts and owls don't define you. <laughs> there is nothing uncool about school spirit. Deck yourself from head to toe and house colors scream at the top of your lungs in the stand for your Quidditch team, but don't go too hard if they win. A fire whiskey hangover does not excuse you from turning in your potions essay in the morning. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Remember not to compromise your beliefs just because you want to be popular as a brave man once said to an even braver child. It takes a great deal of courage to stand up to your enemies and an even greater deal to stand up to your friends. And remember in 19 years you aren't going to care about the professors you hated or the tests you failed. You're going to care about the people you loved the memories you made. For every Dolores Umbridge, there's a Remus Lupin. For every Draco Malfoy, there's a Ron Weasley. For every Triwizard tragedy, there is a Yule Ball. And there's a Butterbeer for any other problem that might come along the way. <laughs> In these dark and troubling times, we have to remember that we are magic and Hogwarts should feel like our home. And remember, if all else fails, Hermione Granger could stay on her grind and get straight A's during a time of unspeakable magic that threatened her very existence, so you can too. <laughs> Dramatic. This is my biggest fan right there. <laughs> Judges, from low to high, we have scores already. Here we go. 7.6.8, 7.5, 8 8.3, 8.7, .7, and an 8.9. Clap it up for the poet, please. So, if there's something happening on stage that you enjoy, please feel free to take to the interwebs and let the folks out there who couldn't fit in this room know about it because if you haven't noticed, this room's kind of full, all right? We're at standing room only status here. Um, you can use the hashtag for the book festival, which is natbookfest.com at atari. What is it? <laughs> natbookfest, woo! Or you can also add at Split This Rock so we know that you love what's happening up here. Um, and I believe the Librarian of Congress also has her own Twitter. I know because she just tweeted and she put my name in it. What? <laughs> Time to die and go to heaven. And now, for your next poet. Everyone, please start clapping right now for Anaya! For Lucas and Latifa, the two stars that burn themselves out far before their time. If tonight is the last night you plan on breathing, if 
If the weight of the world is so heavy on your shoulders, you want the only place you can see to lay down this burden is a grave. If you are so tired of this existence, you want to put yourself into an eternal rest, I'm sorry I cannot make this life more livable for you. But before you go, can I ask you one thing? When you pick up the pen to write the suicide note, write a poem instead about all the things you love and all the things that love you. Write a poem, turn the pain into prose and see how quickly the end becomes a new beginning. Write a poem like your life depends on it because sometimes it does. I too have no nights on bathroom floors with blood and tears streaming so quickly I do not know which one I'll run out of first. No praying to God I stopped believing in a long time ago that if they were real they would make the pain go away. No looking death in the face and inviting him home for dinner like a long lost friend I couldn't wait to get reacquainted with but I have also known salvation. Known that if the words of your demons can end your life then words of hope can save it no matter how deep of a hole you've dug yourself into. Even when holding on to life feels like grasping air, your lungs can't even keep inside of them. Reach your hands out for a lifeline, and I'll give you a pen and tell you that poetry is the pathway to healing that you never saw coming, and ain't I a testament to that? Because I am still standing after depression has brought me to my knees, after I have asked God more times to end my life, and I have thanked him for giving me it, and ain't that a blessing? To survive even when your own body has tried to kill you? to hold healing in your hand, and it gets hard sometimes because you can't even remember how to be a person, much less a poet, but I promise being a poet isn't always about pretty prose. Sometimes it is just about being alive. Hell, most times it's just about being alive here in this place where I have seen so many resurrected, I almost call it holy, call it magic. So let me spellbind you, survival, put down your razor. Don't spill blood, spill ink. Write a poem across your wrists and thighs and show everyone your scars and story and tell them that this is what survival looks like. This is healing. This is life through language. And never forget how hard it was to get here, to turn your back on your demons. But if the pen is mightier than the sword, then it is mightier than any mental illness that has tried to kill you. So tonight, don't write me a suicide note, an obituary, but a period where there should be a comma, write me a survivor story. And I promise I'll see you tomorrow. Judges, your score in three, two, one. Scores up from low to high. I have an 8.6. I have a 9.3, a 9.5, a 9.6, and a 9.8. Clap it up for the poet, please. A hush comes across the crowd. Didn't think that was going to work at all, but I appreciate how giving you all are. Um, you having a good time? Say yeah. yeah. If you ready for some more poetry, say hell yeah. yeah. Coming up next to the stage, please put your hands together for Asher. I am aching to lose myself these days. Fingers curled with the need to touch, to ease the hurt, writing everything down like it matters because maybe it does. Because maybe my feelings aren't real if you can't read them because like a love too young to be any less, maybe a feeling isn't a feeling if it's not physical. 
So make believe that blurry and scuffing along the blue sky are scatters and rags of high cloud, warm from the sun, bright and blinding. Eyes the brown are on the stems of grapes, once clear and lucid, now scan around in watery panic. This amber melancholy is smoking and alive, hands clasped and teeth crooked like a zipper, body worn like an old sweater and stained with things like whiskey-colored regret and drowning in it. These hands are thin and rough and never meant for this. Give me a script, a line to walk, small lights and murmuring conversations. Tell me to just keep breathing because God of nothing said to have something to do because we can't hear all these big plans yet. I reek of uncertainty and half-sleep stupor. So instead of reading between these blurred lines, let us measure the margins and assign meaning in the morning. Language is a landscape punctuated by bodies, faces dazed, tongues slack and mad with heat. Soil sings for our singed similes, so I talk and talk and talk and never say what I mean. Unearth my prose just enough to remember what happened. Write and write about love I will not fall into. About how I crushed what I could because it was small and so was I. About how I wake up and nothing is beautiful the way I imagined it and pretend these words weigh anything. Because maybe they do. Because maybe I don't have to make these loose lyrics, lyrics soft enough to grasp before I litter them across a page. Maybe this isn't an ache at all, and my bones only crack because they are broken ballads begging for a new body, one with palms big enough to write a biography. Eyes like Bible black dream catchers, I am a boy born of hard lemonade and a Midwest April. Somewhere there is a story about kissing once and leaving in sheets of rain, and I do not have to be the one to write it. Judges, scores in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have a 7.5, a 7.9, a 7.9, an 8.1, and an 8.3. Clap it up for the poet, please. And for your listening enjoyment, we have another poem. Please put your hands together for Sophia. Whole grain toast slathered in grass-fed butter, the crusts cut off and thrown away. Dipped in a plate coated in raw sugar cane, her mother brought her munchies while she taught her baby how to read. She pulled books filled with boxes and CDs from under the table. She held them with the edges of her skeletal fingertips so the records wouldn't wreck, and they spun with a voice of wisdom that taught her to ignore the silent H. On her first day of kindergarten, she brought her chapter books and sounded out sentences in her head while the teacher taught the class the alphabet song. White wonder bread coated in the very last scrape of butter, she no longer coughs when she bites into crust mixed with secondhand smoke. Her lungs grew like weeds from the concrete cracks of a womb made of nicotine and whiskey. She makes herself her meal before cleaning up familiar carpet stains left by her mother while her baby slept deeply on the couch to the sounds of 90 sitcom reruns and voices of strange men. She started kindergarten 10 miles away from her but learned the song of beeping metal detectors instead of the ABCs. In fifth grade, I started taking care of myself. My mother let her skeletal fingertips grow some skin around the bone. She entrusted my teachers to fulfill my thirst for words. No longer was she busy with our pocketbooks and ABCs. She remembered she needed to eat. By fifth grade, she's in foster care. Her face tells the story of broken beer bottles slashed across smooth brown skin, skin that should have stayed soft until puberty gave it ridges. She learned that you can make a child grow old with suffering without giving her the time to age. She's assigned a book report, but it's hard to make honor roll when your mother was gone while hers was reading her to sleep, while the books in your classroom ripped at the hinges. How were you supposed to learn to read then when the books in her classroom smelled of paper printed fresh while she learned to read Hamlet and A Midsummer Night's Dream, while you sat before a conveyor belt bringing in new mouths to feed? It's a decade and some too late when they finally decide to open our borders and let us get to know each other. 
And when she gets her first history report, I wipe a chalkboard of happy drawings from an imagination that wants to replace her memory, and she copies the vocab words one by one. When I ask her to name the face of 20th century hate, she is silent with no answer. When I ask her to name the faces of peaceful demonstration, she is silent with no answer. When I ask her if she knows her history, she is silent with no answer. When I ask her if she could read the history that her teachers never taught her, she is silent with no answer. So why should I be able to learn from history and be the future? So why should she be lost without words and forced by the man to stay in the past? To that, you and I, my dear sister, are both silent, waiting for an answer. Scores up three, two, one. From low to high, I have a 6.8, a 6.9, a 7.2, a 7.7, .7, and an eight. Clap it up for the poet, please. And now, for the last poet in the first round, Chazzy! Black man ain't found in history books unless he's broken or broke or breaking in or broke in. Black man ain't found in history books unless he's a puppet painted as a hero, says to be successful like him, assimilate, sell out, become as white as the page he's on. The strong black man ain't in history books more than a quota requires because to document too many black martyrs would give little black kids too much strength, and to document too many living, breathing blacks would give them too much hope, and to document too many black inventors would give them too much ambition. So put a history book in front of the little black child, only show them their ancestors bloody, broken, raped, and stolen, convince them from a young age submission is in their blood, that their only chance of getting rid of it is to bleed it out. Tell them they're better off blending in. That in these books, blacks are never the hero, seldom the victim, always the villain. That if they want to know more than just how their ancestors died, they have to take it as a high school elective. That in these schools, their culture isn't taken seriously. Neither are their achievements but they should still be happy to learn about a white man stealing a black man's land, a black man's life, because look at all this country has done for us. We should pledge to a flag that waves our ancestors' blood in our faces because we don't want to seem ungrateful for our freedoms, right? We should stand and sing along to the national anthem because they cut out the slave verse, right? We should support our black troops fighting for a country who doesn't even care about them because at least this way they're not dying at the hands of their own country's hate, right? At least this way someone will care enough to remember them, right? At least this way they will finally be labeled as heroes, right? At least this way someone will finally put them in a history book. Judges, scores up in three, two, one. Scores up from low to high, I have an 8.4, an 8.5, an 8.9, an 8.9, and a 9.3. Clap it up for the poet. Woo! That's the first round. Let me rephrase that. That was just the first round. Oh. The hardest part of, of, of um, hosting is knowing what you're doing. And two, I'm not allowed to say anything about the poems as they go up. Like, if something really affects me, I have to come up and be like, judges, please tell me your scores. Like, it didn't just happen. 
but we're all here together. And y'all are doing a really good job, like, because y'all are being real expressive for, like, every poem. And, like, every poem has smacked me across the face at least once. Uh, if you're having a good time, say yeah. yeah. If you're having a good time, make some noise. <laughs> it's good. I hope you're learning something, too. It's time for the second round. We're getting right back in it. We're going right back up the other order. If you are enjoying yourselves and think that poetry is powerful and has a purpose, please stick here after the show and come talk to some of us who do this for a living. We would love to bring these programs to your schools. We would love to tell you about the events that we have going on around the city. If you have to leave early, just go to splitthisrock.org. That's again, splitthisrock.org. And now, the next round, I wanted to give her a breath so she didn't have to run back up here, but going in the reverse order, we're starting with the last poet we just heard. Please put your hands together for Chazzy! How many daddy's girls could my daddy turn sour if my daddy could still call himself a daddy? He got six girls. Before as long as I can remember, I was always daddy's princess. And he my king, my dragon slayer, my knight in shining armor, but never put a parent on a pedestal. Because kings don't always do their duty. Knights aren't always found noble, and dragons don't always get slain. And my mama, she say my daddy always been the same, but I know he was the remedy to my tears, not the reason. He used to let me ride in his blue Chevy and teach me how to work the radio, and we'd go jogging on Sunday mornings, and I still wonder if we had been in church instead of running, could that have changed this? Could that have stopped him? Could that have saved us? It doesn't matter now. He used to take me to Maxwell's Market to get shrimp salad or couscous, and I still don't know what couscous is, but it tastes good. <laughs> he used to give me a small sip of his wine, and daddy, you were never drunk or high but you hit the highway like it was a blunt. Puff, puff, you passed up your right a few too many times, and I stopped screaming daddy's home because it was past my bedtime. But I was still awake because you didn't slay those scary dragons under my bed, so daddy, tell me how many dragons could destroy daddy's kingdom if daddy left his kingdom for dead, if dragons started having names like Angela and Shannon, and the monsters in my nightmares became his mistresses, and I stopped worrying if they were under my bed because I knew they were in his and he had betrayed me, us. But I did a good job of never biting the hand that fed me, poison daddy. I moved out four years ago. And I still wonder if you know I'm angry, if you know your name ain't on speed dial anymore, if you know you make bastards sound so heavenly. Like, yeah, I know you, but I really don't want to while my mama ain't leave you before you had the chance to break both our hearts. How you make stepdaddy sound like a blessing? How you make me feel so heavy and hangry and hollow and dark like I got demons, daddy? Because of you, I got demons, but I don't got you. And that's one less demon, and I'm sorry I was ever a daddy's girl. And how many daddy's girls could my daddy turn sour if my daddy could still call himself a daddy? <laughs> Judges, scores in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, we have a 9.1. We have a 9.3, a 9.4, a 9.5, and a 9.6. Clap it up for the poet. If you haven't noticed, we've made it to the second round where you can talk about whatever you want. And they are going to take that seriously. All right, 
Let's keep that energy going. Y'all ready for your next poet? Say poetry. poetry. Please put your hands together right now for Sophia. According to WebMD, it has been scientifically proven that a hamburger, a bottle of vodka, a pill from your pharmacist, a t-shirt with an attached metal detector, a computer screen, a knife, and even your very own sex organs have the undeniable power to take your life and all in the exact same way. So I guess I didn't believe in internet science until I, until I started to go through the bull black print on the medical records in my file cabinet. Dominant genes cross dominant genes. I was destined to be the poster child for either AA, the Renfrew Center, my strange, or my strange addiction. And with the flip of the dice, it would be determined that bathroom scale would become chapel. The military diet would become the gospel. Three days devoted to starvation, one for the father, one for the son, and the last for the Holy Spirit. I suppose I stopped believing in God when I begged him to give me the strength to starve and he gave me weakness in return. When I assumed he gave me my, my life to earth so my body could eat itself from the inside out like black crows feeding on dying flesh. As a child, they taught me in Catholic school that it was a sin to commit suicide, but how could I not believe that it wasn't God's purpose, my life's purpose, to make my body so small it would evaporate into thin air? That happiness could, would come when I could walk into a room and shiver quietly on my own while the rest of the world felt the kind of warmth that makes your eyes close slowly on their own. My body unable to creak the most ancient floorboard, I would stop taking up so much space, I would stop apologizing for being alive because now I was just a corpse. When the human body starves, all it can think about is food. When all it can think about is food, the sadness goes away. When the sadness goes away, the dopamine does too. And when feeling is gone, your addiction has reduced you to a vegetable. Feelingless corpse, dying slowly with no water to help it grow. Recovery brought back feeling, and while I don't like to be rained on, I now knew I needed it to grow roots strong, deep into the soil, find water for my deserted body to feed my mind, learn slowly that trees can grow amongst fungus. Feeling dread and sorrow and worry and pain, I could genetic engineer my own body, step out of my coma to end generations of pain, when at birth I was declared to be just a corpse. So before you ask an addict how it feels to be addicted, before you ask a dying girl how it feels to starve and blame fat shaming or diet culture, ask them first how it feels to feel nothing at all. Ask her first if the hunger pains have numbed her own. Judges, scores in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have a 7.3, a 7.6, a 7.9, an 8.7, and an 8.7. Clap it up for the poet. And keep that energy going for the next poet, Asher! When I was seven, like many other children, I raced raindrops down the chilled surface of my mother's backseat car window. Like other children, my tummy turned when the moon's seemingly mournful gaze managed to filter in through treetops no matter how many corners we turned, I was convinced it was following me. I remember my mother comparing my body to that of rain-smooth stone, my thoughts the weather above the ocean. She tells me my storms are unpredictable, but she's always just telling me things. Like, get your fingers off the window, you're going to leave prints on them, and I don't know. It was just saying that even when I didn't ask or care, making three words feel like four, a flaky pie crust of my mind, circuits of static and licked batteries. Before I was 11, and learned the water cycle and missed doors, narrow, always too bright, carpet never cleaned classroom, I asked my mother where my tears went in the night. Remained stoic when she replied, I don't know. Asked my dreams instead. While she drew bathwater, I drew conclusions. Decided I could still see things with my eyes closed. Decided I could crush rules under tons of air and salt that there were records of the tides here and rivers were the same lukewarm blue of my bedsheets. 
Thunder, thunder promised, but didn't deliver last night. She's like a forlorn and bewildered mummy. I watched the wind whip the ground cloth, scrutinized the clouds looming like a funeral where you aren't really sure who died. A mammoth hook of muddy water, a can opener to the mirage of dervish waves. I thought I knew. The day we ran out of hot water, like we were always running out of things, like time and what to say and yellow light, all the things she doesn't know, they're coursing through carrot peels in my sink, condemned to trickle into sludge and sand before reaching the ocean. We are both thirsty but it is careless or cruelty, watering the street as well as the lawn, so the facts go damp around their borders. I creep down the hall into the closet where at the back the walls still smell of hair oil and oranges. Mama, the moon is staring at me. Mama, it's raining, and Mama, I don't know where the river is. I am a mess of good intentions gone wrong. I strike a match on myself to keep others warm, but the whole world is on fire, and I'm trying so hard to put it out that the dam breaks, and the waters of my soggy sorrow pour free, and I am sorry. So very, very sorry. And I will drown everyone to prove it. Judges, from low to high, I have an 8.2, an 8.3, an 8.5, an 8.5, and a 9.4. Clap it up for the poet. I just want to do this again because these folks have been coming out like uh, racers where they tag each other out. What is that called? Relay racers. You're welcome and doing an amazing job, I think. I don't speak the language, but they look like they're doing it very, very well. Can we please clap one more time for our interpreters? Because the world is better when everybody has access. Coming up next, please put your hands together for Anaya! Um, just real quick trigger warning for um, sexual assault and sexual violence. When my little brother asks me, all of his eight-year-old body tremoring if monsters are real, I will want to lie to him, tell him that they aren't that they are all fog figments of fear that only exist in his nightmares, all imagination, that he has nothing to worry about, and I know it sounds deceiving, but if given the choice, I would have chosen the ignorance, the innocence. But sometimes we don't have much option in the things that happen to us and the lessons we learn far too quickly. I have known monsters of men. One who show their fangs in the prettiest of smiles then draw me in just close enough to take a bite out of me. And no matter how many times my fist have made blow with his belly, he still has not regurgitated the piece of me he swallowed. And I have grown far too fired of asking of it back because men like him have always just taken what they wanted. No matter how many no's they have had to swallow in the process or how much of his skin I have left beneath my nails from the fight and it be the only piece of me I have left. Along with the ache in my chest still mourning my stolen innocence and the memories like the grasp of his fist or the crack in my back or the feeling of the wall he pushed me against while he tried to push into me or the sting of his shh don't tell nobody won't nobody believe you anyways and he was right when I accused my best friend of sexual assault everyone accused me of falsifying Lying, called me whore, but hauled him confused boy caught up in his feelings. I called him monster. And they asked me what I did to make him that way. What a girl has to do to cause someone so close to her to commit such unspeakable acts. And maybe that's why they stayed silent through all of this. Through the bleeding and the broken while I tended to my wounds and he went off to find the next girl who he will hold just as tightly as he did me and call her best friend. And little sister, 
and his favorite girl and bearer of faults when he makes a mistake for the third time and home he can't wait to force himself into embody he can't wait to force himself into and go he will wrongfully write a passage into woman and everything but victim everything but catastrophe he created like he ain't the scariest kinds of creature the one who hides in plain sight so when my little brother asks me if monsters are real i will scowl and tell him yes but that the deadliest kind don't live underneath your bed nah they lay beside you in it Judges scores, three, two, one, from low to high, I have an 8.6, a 9.1, a 9.2, a 9.2, and a 10. Clap it up for the poet. Coming up next, keep that energy going for your next poet, Taya! There are remnants of scars on my back from where his ancestors whipped mine, and he likes to claw at them. When we kissed, it felt like a 1960s black and white I dream of genie fantasy, when in reality I was the genie from Aladdin waiting to be set free, and black and white was all he could ever see. He speaks like a slave master, yet jumps down my throat when I accuse him of mirroring his ancestors, and I see them in the arch of his brow and underscoring his jaw. But that kiss, that kiss is a leash woven of let me fix him, I can fix him, please let me fix him, let me teach him to paint with the colors of the wind like a Disney sanitized Pocahontas, never mind what happened to the real Pocahontas. Let me shield his body from your bullets, blanketing his with mine like that weird scene in the climax of Pocahontas. Now we're back to that Pocahontas metaphor. And I am back to defending a racist who wants to colonize the space between my thighs. How am I supposed to learn to stand strong when I have spent so much time kneeling for my oppressor? Every so often he loosens his grip on the leash, lets it go as far as it can stretch, and then whips it back like I'm a bitch who might bite with affirmations of, you look nice today, you write so well. Mmm, girl, that ass, though. Heel, girl, sit. Stay. He teases me with treats so I will do a trick and then does not give me one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I am like a frog in a pot and he is a mad scientist waiting to turn up the heat and boil me alive. Do you know how it feels to be like Wonder Woman going to the front lines to fight only to find he was on the other side the whole time, possessed by Ares? Do you know how it feels to realize women of color are Amazon warriors and racist white men do not deserve us? Um, so from here on out, I will be pulling Alyssa Strada on all misogynistic cans of Miracle Whip who are hell-bent on turning me into a palatable milk chocolate to mix into their vanilla, to colonize, to fetishize. And I encourage you to join me and join my nation of carefree women of color who are strong enough to make this nation bend their will and to pull themselves off that leash and love themselves first. We are not exotic spices to be yanked off of vines, put in jars, and kept on shelves. And we are not dogs to be kept in cages when we act up.
Judges scores up in three, two, one, from low to high. I have a 7.8. You good? 7.9, 8.5, 8.9, and a 9.2. Clap it up for the poet. We have two more poets before this is over. Are you ready? Make some noise. Coming up next, Catherine. Keep clapping. This is on. I hope you can hear this. You better hear this. You asked me to write a poem I have already rewritten. I can't read the news anymore, literally. My eyes blur every headline, the news, of course, being the fact that Nazis are back. Literal, actual Nazis and the news that censored is a child rapist, foreign leaders making headlines in our own country more than their own, CNN anchors treating false news as facts, and Fox News cameramen paid to reshoot. Washington Post, please post anything other than Washington. Can we just recount this, start the timer over, let's go back to before November, before we had a censored businessman who has claimed bankruptcy six times and in no time at all shut down the investigation on the Flint water crisis, poisoning my body by sponsoring an anti-choice bill in a room full of men. This mandating mother censored banned Muslim countries as if religion has a physical location and as if religion is the thing to fear here. Not that racist in an orange collar-stained suit. How did we mess up this bad here? An inauguration speech written to include the slogan for the KKK, a vice who believes in electrocuting queer teens, unrelated, but checking the box for some election was hard. Do you support accidental nuclear war or purposeful genocide? Great news, one box, not to name any boxes by names, had both and a lot of other stuff. I used to build box forts as a child, but thankfully, I grew up and didn't move on to building walls. I'm trying to tear them down, but lately I've been too busy, I guess, just surviving on cardboard, I guess, writing any news I can. If someone's 140 characters can ignite the whitest fire in a neo-Nazi's heart, I guess mine should be able to smother it. <clears throat> Racial violence is rude and terrible, Spreading good blood on taxpayer lawns. America must stop this bad. <laughs> My fingers are moving too fast. I lose track. Typing class in elementary taught me the base keys. A, S, D, F, J, K, L, semicolon. I'm thinking with all the education cuts, all someone's learning is A, M, E, R, I, K, K, K. I'm not as informed as I need to be trying to keep up, but the Fox News commercials look so invited. Yeah, I want to sham wow. Stop up the blood on the streets they're trying to blame on whatever minority it is this week. Two months ago, I wrote a poem. I've kind of given up rewriting it because we don't need a new start. We need a revolution. Black Lives Matter. The first pride was a riot. Keep abortion legal. Feminism means nothing if it is not intersectional. Judges, scores in three, two, one from low to high. I have an 8.4, a 9.1, a 9.2, a 9.3, and a 10. Clap it up for the poet. Y'all ready for the last poem? Say yeah. Coming up next to the stage, please put your hands together for Maya!
To every white person who is surprised that racism still exists in 2017. Did you think it died just because we stopped calling it a plantation? Is it because the owners look more like Wall Street suit and tie stockbrokers trading children from the city's poorest schools for jail cells? Do you think it died just because the master has a badge now? Why do you care so much that he replaced his whip with a gun when his target was always a black body? Did you hope his shackles wouldn't someday imprison your son? Or were you surprised that some babies come into this world rope already tied tight around their necks? Did you find yourself at the mercy of another headline, hoping that your son's name wouldn't be mentioned next to Trayvon's or Tamir's or Emmett's or Philando's? Did you ever consider why after each of those names the next one never surprised you? Is it because your Facebook feed can afford to be all cute kittens and pumpkin spice lattes? Did you not see the videos of black and brown children's bodies traded as trauma stories on white people's Facebook pages to prove how woke you are? To prove how open your eyes are because your eyes can afford to be both blinking and alive? To prove that your heart can be both beating and be not asking to get shot by a cop? Does it surprise you that black and brown children raised under ball and chain, clad in orange jumpsuit, got paid nothing to make your car's license plate? To sew the stars on your country's freedom? Did it surprise you when Heather died because you thought people who looked like you are bulletproof? Or because you thought you'd never have to find out? Does it surprise you Will it surprise you when police rob another child of his life, use his skin color to determine the quality of his education, the nutrition of his food? Or will it only surprise you when another army of white nationalists with torch and swastika flag march through the streets? You say you don't see color, so why is your Facebook page awfully active when a white ally dies for doing the right thing, but silent when a person of color dies for existing? You say you can't believe how bad hate is in 2017, but how many more bones do you need to stand on before you realize your country was built on a graveyard? How many more souls have to lose their bodies before you stop being surprised and start listening? Have you considered how much more of your surprise this world can tolerate? How many more headlines will it take before you stop being surprised that racism still exists and start being angry? Judges, scores up. Three, two, one, from low to high, I have an 8.5. I have an 8.8, .8, an 8.9, a 9.2, and a 9.9. .9. Clap it up for the poet. You can't say I didn't tell you. May I have every poet to touch the stage on the stage right now, please, while we're tabulating the scores? Can we give them the round of applause that they deserve? All right, all right, all right. So, because we are about to go over time, if we have not already. <laughs> uh, I just want to say a couple of things. One, on behalf of Split This Rock, 
Um, we are so honored to be able to come and hold this space. Thank you to the Library of Congress. Thank you to the people at the National Book Festival for making this possible. I would like to say that this is just an ordinary thing, but we know that some of the words that I got said here are inflammatory um, or dangerous, um, but true, right? And until we live in a world where we can just tell the truth and it doesn't have to be a special occasion, we're still gonna have these poetry readings here, there, and everywhere because these young people deserve, <laughs> demand, have earned, will take, the microphone as needed. On, uh, on behalf of Split This Rock and the Library of Congress, I wanna thank our esteemed judges. Thank you so very much for taking your time to be here. Some powerful and amazing people. I would also like to thank the National Endowment of the Arts, yes. And I would also like to ask you to keep fighting for it. And now, since we had these judges give numbers to score uh, these poems, um, I'm going to tell you who is third, uh, second, and first, knowing full well that we all won. Yay! The point is not the point. The point is not the point. The point is the point. There we go. In third place, coming from Catherine. In third place, from Minnesota, Catherine! In second place, from Baton Rouge, Chazzy! Can I get a drum roll? And in first place, from Washington, D.C., Anaya Smith! Thank you all for coming. Please, if they are open to it, come and say hello to one of the poets. Um, give them a high five. Uh, please ask before you hug. Um, but yeah, come and talk to us. If you want to know more about Split This Rock, Library of Congress, all that jazz, we will be up here with business cards and love. And there's a table in the back about all things Split This Rock where Sue is waving her hand right now. Have a good night and support uh, local art. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.